Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law. And for today's story, we've got a story out of the Me Too movement. This is a story when a group of people came together to make allegations against people anonymously. Someone started a Google Word document, Google spreadsheet, and people were able to add to it anonymously. And one of the people that was put on this list is suing for defamation. And so he's trying to get to this. Now, has there been an issue? with immunity under the Communications Decency Act, whether or not these people would be immune or not. And there have been some issues with how they can how they can be held responsible. So this is a judgment. The case is still ongoing. It's from the middle of the case from the district court. And so they're trying to decide whether or not to dismiss the case. And the district court says no. And I think it covers a lot of interesting grounds. So we're going to cover this story. So let's get started with this. The plaintiff in this case, one of the people that was put on this list as an alleged abuser, is an author and a content creator. Throughout his career, he has published dozens of articles and opinion pieces, personal essays, and books, including a memoir titled The Adderall Diaries. This person's written work, both fictional and non-fictional, includes graphic and violent depictions of prurient matter, often including of a more restrained variety. Plaintiff depicts instances of non-consensual prurient acts, including recounting his own experiences as a person who engaged in this acts as a perp as a being person being perpetrated on when he was a child he writes about the non-voluntary prurient fantasies i'm desperately trying to get around the algorithm as i rewrite all these words in my head so this is lots of fun his fictional work and non-fictional memoirs include characters who have survived prurient activity of an aggressive nature He's questioned whether prurient activity can be voluntary and referring to one of his scenes as certainly voluntary, certainly bordering on the non-voluntary variety. As the plaintiff has acknowledged, some of his work is very dark and is not palpable to all his audiences. All right, I think I got around all that stuff in the, in the YouTube algorithm by rewriting the language into more sophisticated language. But yeah, this, this author has written both about his own about his own experiences as a person who these things were being done to him so his own experiences as a as a as a as a victim and he's also written about fictional experiences where these things are happening to other people and things that may straddle the line or even not straddle the line and also things that include more restrained natures of of prurient experiences so uh his 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 literature may not be to everyone's taste but it's what he's writing about. On or about October the 17th, 2017, the plaintiff's name was mentioned on a shared Google document spreadsheet, which has gained the name of the shitty media men list. So this, this name, which I will not repeat again because YouTube, but that's the name of it. It has a well-known name for it. So if you're interested in this story, just Google that three word phrase and you'll learn a lot about that. But yeah, this this thing was being circulated around and people were putting people's names on there and accusing them of all kinds of things quasi anonymously. So under the heading of alleged misconduct, the plaintiff's entry initially stated accusations of non-voluntary prurient activity and prurient harassment. On or about October the 11th and October the 12th, the entry regarding the plaintiff was revised to read non-voluntary prurient accusations harassment of a parade nature, coercion, unsolicited invitations. Uh, how do you make a solicited invitation? I want to know. And that, I, I was, that was always my thing about like the unsolicited invitation. What does a solicited invitation look like? Because you can't really have a solicited invitation without that itself being unsolicited. Someone has to make an unsolicited step first, right? You, the only way it could be solicited is if someone asks. But that asking would have to itself be unsolicited. So it's, it's impossible without someone making the first unsolicited move. Anyways, but never mind. And a dude who snuck into a store. According to the complaint, the defendant, together with Sir Jane Doe's, because we're suing, we're suing a named person, the person who purportedly ran this list, the person who is the chief author of it. And we're also suing 30 different women as anonymous Jane Doe's at this point. They outlined the plaintiff's entry in red, singling the plaintiff was accused of multiple instances of this behavior. Likewise, the column headed notes indicated that multiple women have alleged misconduct. Although the entry for the plaintiffs initially appeared at row 13, it was subsequently moved to 12. The plaintiff complains the allegations included him in this list are false. Defendant Doe again has alleged, 
Defendant Doigan is alleged to be the creator of this list. She, along with the Jane Doe's, circulated the list to numerous people in the media industry by email and other electronic means. The purpose of the list was to encourage people to anonymously publish allegations of sexual misconduct by men in the media sector. According to the plaintiffs, plaintiffs were encouraged to publish allegations of misconduct, whether or not they had personal knowledge of the conduct or evidence to corroborate. So even rumors were encouraged. Defendant alleged, together with the Jane Doe's, actively edited, removed, organized, published, highlighted, and added to the list. Defendant is alleged to have added headings, including name, affiliation, alleged misconduct, and notes. Defendant also added a header to the top of the list that read, men accused of violence of a prurient nature by multiple women are highlighted in red. On October the 12th, 2017, BuzzFeed published an article about the existence of a list, and various other news media outlets rant reported on it. At about this point, more than 70 men had been added to the list. By defendant's own characterization, the list had gone viral, well, viral, and she took the list offline after about 12 hours. So it didn't last very long, but it, it got quite a lot of traction during its, its brief moment in the sun. So we have a bunch of people who are contributing to the list anonymously, or at least quasi-anonymously. And we have one person who is centralizing this, and other people are adding into it. And so we'd like to sue for defamation because we think that there have been false things said about us, that we have done that, that we've done bad things, and we'd like to sue the people who are responsible for saying these bad things. So we have a couple issues: who are we suing, and how? And can we get to the creator of the list for things other people said? Because that might be a CDA two hundred and thirty problem. So who can we sue for what? So first thing we have to figure out is what are we suing over? Let's do that. So to state a claim for defamation in New York, the plaintiff must allege a written defamatory state concerning the plaintiff, publication to a third party, fault, which is either negligence or actual malice in the case of a uh, public figure, falsity, and special damages or per se action accountability, which is pretty much the standard for defamation everywhere. People phrase it differently, but that's pretty much it. With respect to the third element, if plaintiff is considered a limited purpose public figure, that person must show the statements were made with actual malice. That is to say, with knowledge the statements were false or reckless disregard malice to the truth, not to the person. Defendant argues the plant is a limited purpose public figure, thereby triggering this additional pleading requirement. Often this inquiry is undertaken by a court only once the plant parties have complete discovery. So whether or not these things apply, we might wait till after discovery is finished. However, when a question is whether a person is a public figure can be determined based on the pleadings alone, the court may deem the person a public figure at that motion. So if you can make the determination, you can do that. To prove that a person is a limited public purpose figure, a, demonstrate, a person must demonstrate that the plaintiff has successfully invited the public in in attention to his views and efforts to influence others prior to the incident that is the subject of the litigation, voluntarily injected himself into a public controversy relating to the subject of litigation, assumed a position of prominence in a public controversy, and maintained a regular and continuing access to media. Plaintiff effectively concedes that he satisfies the first and fourth elements. The crux of the court's undertaking, therefore, is defining the controversy related to this litigation and then determining whether the plaintiff has voluntarily injected himself and assumed a position of prominence. So, is he a limited purpose public figure? Has he injected himself into the public controversy? And he did so before the controversy started, most pointedly, because you can't become a public figure after the fact. You know, so did you become a public figure beforehand? Were you in, involved in this? Did you invite this? So these are the kind of things we have to look at to figure out whether or not he's a public figure to figure out what the standard for a defamation might be. The Second Circuit has defined a public controversy as any topic on which a sizable segment of society has different, strong views, even if the topic does not involve public debate or criticism of a public official. Okay? Taking the precedent into consideration, several key principles emerge. A controversy is a specific question or a real issue being discussed at a time at the defamatory statement. A controversy is broader than only one statement or discussion contained in the allegation document. That is not to say there are no bounds whatever as to what controversy entails. For example, the Second Circuit has defined a controversy as relating to prurient and unclothed conduct in films and not any aspect of prurient, prurient mor moralities or multiple person prurient, prurient events. The definition of a controversy has been argued at length, with much emphasis placed on the prior case law by both sides. The plaintiff has relied on defendant's own discrimination of the rationale in creating the list. Piecing together various passages from defendant's The Cut article, plaintiff articulates the controversy as the intractable problem of widespread prurient harassment and prurient physical conduct 
against women as well as the difficulties women face reporting and preventing such harassment and physical violations. The court agrees with the defendant that the controversy related to the subject of this litigation is inexorably linked with what has been called in the shorthand the Me Too movement. However, rather than defining the controversy as any aspect of parent consent, morality, and power, which would traverse the second court's opinion, the court's definition of the controversy is tethered to the Me Too movement as it existed at the time of the alleged defamatory statement in October 2017. Okay, this might be my personal favorite part of the opinion, because now the court has to define what the Me Too movement is. So this is, this is it had to happen eventually, right? Because a court has to figure out what is the nature of the, of the relevant inquiry. So a court now has to describe in very cold kind of judicial language, what exactly is the Me Too movement? What are its contours? So I don't know if anyone else has ever tried to define the Me Too movement before, but now this poor, poor court has to define it. So this is the this is a working definition of the Me Too movement, at least as it existed at the relevant time in 2017. So at least in 2017, this is apparently what the Me Too movement is, at least as far as this court's concerned, which is better than anything else I've ever seen so far. So let's give this a try. A brief overview of the Me Too movement is a helpful place to start. <sighs> Me Too was first termed in 2006 by Tarana Burke, a black female activist, as a name for a movement to help victims of prurient harassment and um, physical violence. Me Too captured, or Me Too capitulated into the public consciousness in October of 2017. On October the 5th, 2017, Jody Cantor and Megan Tolley at the New York Times published an article detailing decades of current harassment allegations against the Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. Or is it Weinstein? I always forget. On October the 15th, 2017, actor Elisa Milano wrote on Twitter, if you've been currently harassed or assault, write Me Too as a reply to this tweet. Within days, thousands have heeded her call, and thus the voices of the few became many, which sounds very Star Trek-esque. I'm not sure that's what the court was going for, but whatever. And the Me Too movement became a chorus, bolstering the credibility of victims of current assault and harassment. The list spreadsheet was published by defendant on or about October the 11th, 2017, in the 10-day period between what when Cantor and Tolley broke the Weinstein story and when Milano wrote Me Too. Me Too. So in the peak, in the peak of the witch hunt, fear dream, this is when this came about. But what was the controversy in the first days of the Me Too movement? Good question. The court follows the wall bomb mandate as to examine whether a person actually were discussing some specific question at the time of defamatory statement. What are the contours of this thing? At the time of the statement, October the 11th, 2017, the discussions were centered on issues of prurient assault, prurient harassment, and consent in um, business type environments. In the wake of the Weinstein allegations, the burgeoning Me Too movement was focused on how power dynamics and outdated expectations of roles in the workplace have worked to silence women. Milano's first public statement about the allegations illustrate this. Milano, who published a statement on October the 9th, 2017, six days before she tweeted about Me Too, discussed her reaction to the Weinstein allegations solely in terms of the assault, harassment, and discrimination on the basis of sex as it relates to the workplace, which I would think is bad, but again, going to an earlier discussion we had in an earlier video, may be good as far as California is concerned. We have yet to see. So maybe Alessa Milano wants to talk about yeah, that whether or not sexism in the workplace is good or bad, because California is apparently trying to figure that out right now. The Weinstein allegations and spread inspired widespread and difficult conversation about what constitutes inappropriate behavior in a professional setting and how to construe voluntary agreement in prurient engagements between prominent industry players and those seeking opportunities within the industry. The list itself is evidence about this. In the public controversies that daily swirl around this, some plunge into the arena and enter the fray. An individual can become a limited purpose public figure only through his own actions. By entering voluntarily into the sub-market of ideas and opinion, one consents to competition in that marketplace. Any entry into the controversy does not transform a private individual into public. The degree of voluntary engagement is important. So a couple things here is that first of all, it has to be voluntary on the part of the person. So you cannot be drugged into the controversy. So if you weren't a public figure before, you aren't now. You know, you can't be you can't be drugged into a controversy. You have to be you have to voluntarily engage it. And you have to voluntarily engage it at the time. So, you know, whether or not that happened is, is irrelevant. And trying to figure out the contours of it to figure out whether or not you voluntarily engage it is is a thing. 
And so that's part of the reason that the, the court spent time talking about what he's done in terms of his professional life, in terms of his authorship. And so the court's going to say, and I would tend to agree, that no, he's not engaged himself in this controversy. You know, whatever else can be said about his, his work as an author, you know, he's not engaged in the controversy. His, his work well precedes that controversy and is not really, you know, about that as such either. Plaintiff's degree of involvement in a controversy surrounding prurient assault, prurient harassment, and consent in the workplace, if any, is de minimis. Defendant directed the court to only a few tangential references to prurient harassment or jokes of a prurient nature in the workplace in the writing and interviews. And the court is not willing to find that the plaintiff's more extensive writings and interview about the prurient and about more physical aspects of the prurient and more involuntary physical aspects of the prurient unrelated to workplace issues transform him into a public figure with respect to the controversy here. This is unlike the case, a prior case, when a plaintiff frequently spoke on national television and in interviews with mass media about prurient inequality, including that women were frequently, more frequently than men, appear to be uh, defrocked in films and magazines. In other words, the plaintiff there, in that case, voluntarily and substantially involved themselves in the controversy, and thus cannot be said the same here. So having determined that he did not engage himself into this status, the next question is who is liable for what? And, and namely, whether or not the person who is the chief author or initial creator of this list can be held liable. And that's going to get into the Communications Decency Act of 230. And because under CDA 230, you can't be held liable for things that are being spoke, that are being contributed by someone else. So you may have started the list. But what other people added to the list, maybe you're not liable for, or maybe you are. So now we have to get into the issue as to whether or not the person who started this has liability or is immune under CDA 230. So I think for me, this is the most interesting aspect of the case, whether or not the principal creator can be liable for what all these anonymous people wrote. So let's find out. Can they be held liable or not? The defendant argues that the plaintiff's suit is barred by Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Section 230 was enacted to preserve a vibrant and competitive market of ideas that existed on the internet and for other interactive services unfettered by federal or state regulation. The term interactive computer service by law means any information service, system, or access software provider that provides or enables computer access by multiple users to a computer server. Online message boards fall within this definition. The plaintiff alleges that defendant, along with others, created the list as a publicly accessible shared Google spreadsheet, which was accessible via link and could be edited anonymously by whoever received the link. A Google spreadsheet is akin to an online message board as it provides a publicly accessible platform from which individuals can post comments. Accordingly, the defendant does qualify as a provider of an interactive computer service during the time the list was online and formed the spreadsheet. So this person who created it is an online content provider. She has provided a forum through the f through a Google spreadsheet. So CDA 230 initially gives her the status of a as a person who might fall within the definition. But then there's the next question: Did she do something a little bit more specific that would that would go to her liability? So she might be a interactive computer provider. She provided a forum to which people have provided comments. But did she do anything that might create a liability? Let's find out. The court is unable to find that it's evident from the face of the complaint that the allegations against plaintiff included in the list were provided to the defendant by another information content provider. So first of all, we don't know who did it. So it might have been you. There's that. Information content provider is defined to include any person or entry that's responsible in whole or part for creation or development of information provided through the internet or any interactive service. So it might have been you and you might have been responsible for the development of that information. Or whole or part. So you are a you you are the user, you're the content provider, you're the person liable if you in whole or part create contribute to the development of that. And so, well, is she responsible for it? Well, first of all, she might have just herself wrote it, so that would be one thing. And then maybe she did something that made it partly hers. So we have to look to what exactly was this thing? How was it how was it being marketed? What was what were people being asked to do? And so did she do something that might have made her a part contributor or part developer as to be responsible as a speaker? Okay, so now I have to get into the specifics of it. Let's look at that. The Second Circuit has instructed a defendant will not be held responsible for the development of information unless it assisted in the development of what made the content unlawful. So you have to, did, did you help to create that stuff? 
One is responsible for development of information when a person engages in an act beyond mere functions as a publisher. For example, deciding to publish, withdraw, or modify third-party content that changes the meaning and purpose of the content. So if you're changing it, if you're editing the content, that might be enough that in the way that changes its meaning. By contrast, an individual does not develop content where a person provides a neutral assistance, that is tools and functionality that are available to both the good and bad. So if you are merely providing the tools for people to engage in it, you're not responsible. You're only engaged, you're responsible if you them, yourself are doing it. The plaintiff alleges defendant published an allegatory defamatory accusation in the list as related to her by another person. Defendant argues, if true, she's sealed by 230 because she didn't contribute to the meaning and she didn't change the meaning of the content. However, this as argument assumes a key fact not yet known, where the plaintiff materially contributed to the defamatory meaning, which is the very fact on which is 230. So we don't know what you did or what you didn't do because we haven't gotten far enough along. The plaintiff did not expressly plead defendant materially contributed to an unlawful statement she imputed in the list on someone else's behalf. Defendant may not rely on the absence of fact, not pled, secure approach and dismiss. So yeah, we haven't gotten far along enough to know what you're responsible for or not. Further, the plaintiff also rightly points out that if defendant input information into the list that was not provided to defendant, she would not qualify. So she herself wrote it. The structure of 230 is to indicate that immunity only applies with third party information. Thus, if defendant wrote the allegations in the list that had been relayed to her and the third party never intended to be placed, the immunity wouldn't be attached. So if you yourself wrote it, so not that someone else wrote it and you allowed it to exist, but if you wrote it, even if it's communicated to you, that would be enough for your liability because you're the one who actually contributed it to the electronic forum. And that's what the 230 is talking about. Additionally, the plaintiff correctly notes that the interactive computer service provides forfeits their Section 230 immunity if, through their design or through their headers or through personal communications with other people or otherwise, they specifically encouraging the posting of content. So if you're the one who's specifically inducing the specifically illegal stuff, that would be enough. So not just neutrally, but you're specifically asking for it. And that might be the case here. On that issue, the plaintiff directs the court to a disclaimer at the top of the list, which describes it as only a collection of allegations and rumors that should be taken with a grain of salt. Plaintiff argues the statement alone could reasonably have been held to interpret the list re recipients as encouraging them to post rumors. And nowhere did the list ever advise users that only to post about their own experiences. So we were directing people to post rumors. We were soliciting things that were not well done out. So that might be enough. And fortunately, we have some case law for that. So we have a case of roommates.com. Roommates.com provides an illustration as to when desires of a website can be found to have engaged in this solicitation and when they can't. So we look to roommates.com. What did they do and what didn't they do? Roommates.com operate a website designed to match individuals seeking roommates. As part of the online registration form for the surface, roommates required a subscriber to answer questions about their sex, sex orientation, and familiar status, and roommate preference along these same criteria. The potential answers were pre-slept by roommates. So roommates was, was, was specifically soliciting those particular responses. And so because you can't discriminate on the basis of housing, on the basis of these factors, you know, that makes it illegal. And so roommates.com was specifically asking for material that would make it illegal. So that's a problem. Roommates use these responses to these questions to populate a provider page. The Ninth Circuit found that this design forced subscribers to divulge personal protected characteristics and preferences and to match those with who, those who would seek rooms that appear to be prohibited on the Fair Housing Act. Thus, roommates was not entitled to qualified immunity on or entitled to immunity on this aspect. So because, because they specifically ask people to provide information and then use that information to pre-generate things that themselves were violations of the Fair Housing Act, because roommates.com made that specific solicitation, they can't hide behind the fact, well, the people provided it. Yeah, they provided it, but you specifically asked for it. So you were the ones who directed it. They, they you know, if you had just asked, you know, just write whatever you want, that would have been one thing, but you, you, you asked for it. So roommates.com was held liable in that situation. However, the current list is more akin to the empty boxes where you could just write whatever you want. And people who write things that might be a violation of the Fair Housing Act in that situation were not violating the law because they weren't specifically solicited. So that would be a protection. 
The court reasoned that because roommates.com provides the statements as written, it does not provide any specific guidance as to what it contained. It does not urge subscribers to input these preferences. They're not responsible for the development of the content. So when we left it open, when roommates.com got a little bit more clever and left it open as a free form box, then they weren't responsible, even though it had the same effect in practice. So we looked to not only what happened in reality, we looked to what you did. And so when you went from, please provide the specific information to write anything you want. And even though those things were in violation of fair housing, roommates wasn't responsible because they didn't solicit those specific things. So the court here says this list is more similar to that because it didn't, you know, provide, it just said, write your experiences. And so it's a little bit more akin to that. In sum, the barrier to suit is not evidence from the face of the complaint and the motion to dismiss is on the grounds that the immunity is denied. So that is the end of our current coverage of the ongoing case of Stephen Elliott versus Maria Donegan and Jane Doe's 1 through 30. And he was put on this list that was blasted around and all kinds of people, people unknown, said things about him. And there was a motion to dismiss, which so far has been denied. It can go forward and we can get developed. And we don't know who is responsible for what. Presumably we can get a lot of that information from Google. So Google is going to be super helpful to us because we can see... Um, who logged in and what and what IP information we have and who did what edits and so forth and so on. And so we might be able to get people for them. And we might even be able to get Maria for it, depending on the degree to which she might be responsible for development. So we need to get a little bit more, but we have enough to at least get started. So this lawsuit is continuing for now. I think this decision is sound and we will have to see what discovery will hold. But at least for the moment, that's the end of the coverage of this case.